Friends, welcome to worship with Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Katie Day, and I am delighted to be worshiping with you today. I'm joined in worship by uh, Pastor Jody Andrade, as well as by recordings uh, from Hindu Song, our organist, and our chancel choir under the direction of music director Steve Dean. And as always, the service is edited and put together, uh, produced by Claire Kaiser. Friends, today is the first Sunday in the month of September, and that means it's a communion Sunday. So I ask you, if you haven't already, to take a moment and gather together your communion elements. Uh, a piece of bread or a cracker, even a cookie, and uh, a cup of juice or wine, and we will be able to celebrate the sacrament together but apart trusting in God's mysterious and awesome presence to unite us in ways that we do not understand. You might set a sacred space for yourself with a pretty uh, table, uh, tablecloth or placemat, um, or you might trust that uh, God shows up in the chaos of um, a cluttered kitchen or um, a, uh, a lived-in living room with uh, a coffee table with all kinds of things on it. Um, God is present with us. This we know. So friends, let us transition from getting here to being fully present as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
please join me in our call to worship. Here at the feast of God's holy word and God's holy meal, eyes and ears are opened, hearts are opened, so that we may all be made glad and filled with hope. Friends, we gather and worship together and we bring our whole selves to God. So let us then confess our sins and shortcomings before God and one another with humble hearts, contrite and authentic, but with confident hearts, trusting that God will hear our prayers. Let us pray. Almighty and compassionate God, every day, in our desire to attain our wants, avoid discomfort, and shun those we do not know or love, we close up our hearts, our minds, our ears, and eyes. Forgive us, renew us in body and spirit, that we will be able, through your help, to live opened in the way you intend for us. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. The promises of scripture are true, that if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. The old life is gone, it has been washed away, and a new life can begin. So be at peace and know this, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are claimed as God's own child, amen. 
And now as forgiven and beloved children of God, let us pass the peace to one another by crossing our arms over our chest as we say the peace of Christ be with you and extending them outwards to others in your home or to others in the body of Christ, the church universal, as we respond and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hi everyone, it's time for our children's sermon, so gather in close and spend some time with me. In just a moment, I will read a story from the Bible about Jesus. Um, it's actually kind of two stories, uh, but it's a story about a time when Jesus had left his home country and was traveling in a new land far away from his home. Uh, he had some friends traveling with him, um, but there were also a lot of strangers in this new place as he was traveling through these towns. Um, he had somewhere else he was trying to get to. He just had to go through all of these places. Uh, but people knew who Jesus was. They had heard that he was a really great teacher and that he was a healer and that he was saying some wonderful things about God. And so all of these people in these foreign lands wanted to come and see Jesus. And they wanted him to help them, to heal them. They wanted to learn from him. They wanted to uh, see what all the fuss was about and hear what he had to say. Now, Jesus was just traveling. Uh, I don't think he was expecting to have to meet all of these new people along the way and help them out. But in the story that I'm going to read, he will meet a woman who asks for help uh, with her daughter. And he will meet a man whose friends ask uh, for help um, with his hearing. He can't hear. And Jesus helps both of them. Jesus does something new that he wasn't expecting to. And he learned something new. And that is that all people everywhere, no matter where we're from, uh, we're all the same inside and that we need God's love and that we uh, need God's help and that we can learn a lot from Jesus. And Jesus learned from them. So I love this story because it teaches me that if Jesus can learn something new, uh, then so can I. And if Jesus can, um, can open up his mind about something and change his mind about something, then so can I. And that makes me feel confident uh, when I am learning new things and when I'm having to make new decisions. So friends, I hope that you feel the same, that if Jesus can learn something new, so can you. I know that many of you are back in school and we're learning new things um, probably every day, every week. And uh, we know that Jesus is, is right there with us, is learning as well, and is encouraging us to be open to new things. So let's say a prayer. I'll say a few words. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for teaching us things. Help us be open to learning new things. Amen. All right, everyone. I'll see you next time. Bye.
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Holy God, whose spirit comes to us in moments of both strength and weakness, come now into our midst that we might be able to hear your word in fullness and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Listen for God's word. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then Jesus said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to Jesus a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Our text today holds two encounters that don't seem particularly connected, at least at first glance. There's an encounter Jesus has with a Gentile woman that begins rather unfortunately, but ends with a healing and an encounter with a deaf man that begins with a healing and ends with a command to tell no one. But both of these stories offer a surprising takeaway, not from what Jesus teaches us with words, but from what Jesus models for us by example. Well, actually, he says it too. Be opened. It all begins when Jesus is traveling through foreign lands, as is often the case with celebrity. Word gets out and the crowds began to follow him, having heard about his miracles, his healings. A Gentile woman, that means she's not Jewish, sought him out to beg him to heal her daughter. And Jesus says no. Now I preached on this story last summer the version of it in Matthew's Gospel, where the woman is described as being Canaanite, still an outsider, still a foreigner. And try as I might, I simply cannot read this story any other way. So some of this might sound familiar to some of you. I stand behind my reading of this passage, and I believe it's an important insight into the nature of Jesus, who was, after all, fully human as well as fully divine. So the Gentile woman begs Jesus to cure her daughter, and he says to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, which isn't kind. Isn't it all how we'd expect Jesus to respond? Jesus is implying that the children are the children of Israel, God's children, his people. This is off-putting. Jesus doesn't say no to people who are in need of healing. Jesus says yes. Jesus helps. Jesus heals. 
But in this encounter, Jesus looks at a woman on her knees begging for healing for her daughter and says no, and not just no, but adds insult to injury and calls her and her daughter dogs. There are those who would try to soften this blow. Uh, Some say that that Greek word actually means puppies, like a house pet. So it's sweet and endearing. I say no. It's insulting. Some say that Jesus was just really tired. That's why he wanted to hide away in the house. And he's just having an off day. We all get tired, right? Which is true. But I still say no. I don't see Jesus being mean because he's sleepy. And some people say Jesus is testing her faith and he was always going to heal her daughter. And to this, I also say no. Jesus isn't cruel to those desperately in need who seek them out just to teach them a lesson about faith. No, I believe that Jesus was not going to heal her daughter. I believe that Jesus understood his mission to be to the Jewish people, and I believe he was acting in the way he felt sure that he should. And then comes the woman's quick and surprising response. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus, acting finally now a lot more like we've come to expect Jesus to act, Jesus, with a newly opened mind, responds with grace mercy and compassion and says the demon has left your daughter. Jesus had a narrow view of what he was sent to do and perhaps he hadn't really been listening to his own teachings on the kingdom of God. One theologian outlines it all like this, that God's kingdom throughout the gospel of Mark is something surprising and unexpected In Mark chapter 4, we have the seeds are cast indiscriminately. It sprouts up without cultivation. It appears insignificant but becomes monumental. And those expected to perceive it properly turn out to be ignorant, slow, and hard of heart. That's in Mark 4 and in Mark 6. And in Mark 5, we've been introduced to Jesus' lack of control over God's kingdom. When the woman who touched Jesus' garment caused power to zap out of him without his control over it. And now here in chapter 7, we see Jesus himself, seemingly among those characters from the Gospel of Mark, not fully living into the reality of what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus had a clear view of his mission, but it was narrow. He was sent to the children of Israel. But thankfully, this Gentile woman helped change his mind, help open his mind, so that he might have the opportunity to literally practice what he's been preaching about the kingdom of God. That God's covenantal relationship with humanity is no longer about who's in or who is out. Nobody's out. We're all family The kingdom of God is about love that is bigger and broader and more open than even Jesus imagined. Which brings us to the next encounter we have in today's story. When Jesus left Tyre, he headed into another foreign land, back into the crowds that gathered wherever he went, and a group of people brought a deaf man to him, who not only could not hear, but who had a speech impediment as well. And again, Jesus is given the opportunity to practice what he preaches, to be opened to this expanded view of his role in bringing about God's kingdom. The healing seems a bit unorthodox compared to some of his others. Generally, Jesus' healings in Mark go something like this. Stand up, take your mat and go home. Stretch out your hand. Your faith has made you well. Little girl, get up. The demon has left your daughter. But this time, it's different. Maybe it's harder to heal Gentiles? Jesus took the man aside in private. And the pronouns are not clear here. But either way, it's weird. He stuck his fingers into his ears, is what the text tells us. And it could be into Jesus' own ears or into the man's ears. 
and then he touched his tongue. Again, either his own tongue or the man's tongue, and he spits. And it's all weird and kind of gross and honestly unfathomable in COVID times, right, to be uh, that up in somebody's business. And after all that, Jesus looked up to heaven and sighs, as if this was all just too much for him too. And finally, Jesus, sounding now a lot more like we've come to expect Jesus to sound, says to the man, be opened. And the man can hear, and he can speak. And Jesus tells him to keep quiet, but that's just silly to say to a man who can speak clearly for the first time in ages. So of course, that man goes out telling everyone what Jesus has done. Once again, Jesus got to practice what he preached, taking a chance on healing another foreigner, another Gentile, taking a chance on sharing God's grace with people who weren't Jewish because those people needed him needed healing, needed to know that they, too, are part of God's plan, part of God's kingdom. And I believe Jesus' choice of wording is wonderful. Be opened. He was speaking from personal experience. You can only hear what you need to hear when you are open to what God is doing, even if it's not what you thought it was originally going to be. Even if it goes against everything you once believed to be true. Jesus was opened by his experience with the Gentile woman, and he was opened by his experience with the deaf man. We understand Jesus to be fully human and fully God, and for centuries, followers of Christ have argued about this and struggled to understand what it means. Perhaps these encounters help us to see that in order for Jesus to be both fully God and fully human, he had to be opened to both at the same time. The incarnation wasn't easy. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, as we say in the uh, historic Apostles' Creed, a confession of faith. But Jesus also suffered the conditions of the human existence, which includes being offered the opportunity to experience something new, something challenging, to take in new information and change his mind. When Jesus responded to the Syrophoenician woman, he opened himself up to something new, a new mission of inclusion in God's covenant community, a mission of reaching out not only to the Jewish people, but to Gentiles, non-Jews, a mission that is directly responsible for all of us being here today. When Jesus healed the deaf man, he was not only giving words to the man who neither heard nor spoke, but also was giving words to what had just happened to him, to Jesus, speaking into existence a mission, not just for himself, but for us all, a new mission of hope and challenge. For it is a challenge, a struggle, to be opened. Even grammatically, it can be a challenge, a command, a dare almost, be opened. When the story says the deaf man's ears were opened, the Greek word there is actually hearing. Uh, His hearing was opened. What do you think he heard? What would you hear if Jesus came along, stuck his fingers in your ears? be opened. The deaf man's tongue was released. What would you say if Jesus touched your tongue and released it? What words would come from your mouth clear for the first time? What would you proclaim? Be opened. It is a healing and a challenge one that Jesus himself experienced. Be opened. These stories of inclusivity combined with Jesus' other experiences of teaching and healing broadcast God's message loud and clear. All of God's children are to be valued and embraced, and perhaps that leaning into this work will challenge us 
to redefine everything we know to believe about ourselves and God. That it will open us to new understandings about everything. That it'll pry us apart a little and ask us to remain that way. To be opened, ongoing, not just once. It's continuous. What we learn from watching Jesus is that there are no external barriers between God and humanity. Race, ethnicity, gender, orientation, age, ability, class, none of these exclude anyone from God's love. And therefore, there should be no external barriers between humans, especially in the church. Be opened. What we learn from watching Jesus is that there is no place God isn't working. And no one is excluded from learning something new about God's great love for the world, about God's mission for the church, for us. Be opened. What we learn from watching Jesus is that being opened is one of the hallmarks of the kingdom of God. I know. We are all sick of hearing about unprecedented times, but it just seems so possible to me that what is happening in the world and what is happening in and to the church involves this challenge to be opened, to get ready for what's next, to trust that God's mission turns out to be bigger than we ever imagined. Be opened. And perhaps what we are given to see here at the communion table today is more than just the breaking of a loaf, the sharing of a cup. It's one last look from Jesus before he had to go, before we could know what would happen next, before we could possibly understand any of it, let alone believe it, of opening himself to something new. This is my story right here. He says, this is my mission, my heart, even my very body being opened for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this table, We are guests invited. This isn't a Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church table. It isn't even a Presbyterian table. It's definitely not my table. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who invites us to be opened to this invitation, to this moment of communion of community being united with Christians, believers all over the world throughout time and space, as well as communion with the God who created us, who redeems us, who sustains us. So friends, come to the table. The invitation is free and all are welcome. And now that we are gathered around Christ's table, let us pray. Pure of heart, O God, we seek to be pure of heart. We ask this for ourselves, that we may live fully by being in right relationship with you. And we ask for pure hearts for the good of the world, so we may work without ceasing to usher in your kingdom. Focus us, not on things which defile us, but on whatever is pure and right and just and good. With pure hearts, Holy One, we can worship you, serve you, and act as your hands and feet in this world. We thank you for this table you've prepared for us. We are grateful 
for the invitation to come as we are, imperfect, but trying to follow in your footsteps. We thank you for the rich symbolism of these elements, that in taking them, we remember Christ's life, death, and resurrection. As we eat and drink, just as the disciples did 2,000 years ago beside you, we now proclaim the saving death of you, our risen Lord. Jesus, we pray for each person not joining us at the table this morning, for the sick, the lonely, the incapacitated, for the misguided, uninformed, and angry, for those who willingly turn away from this table, and for those who have tragically been refused a seat by a misguided church, give them a glimpse of your hope and love, we pray. May the love that is Jesus Christ find them in whatever circumstances they dwell. It is in you that we live, that we die, and will one day live again. Praise be to God. Amen. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed by one friend, denied by another, rejected and abandoned by the rest, he gathered those friends together. He gathered them around a table for a meal, and he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship between God and God's people. It is sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And whenever you drink from it, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do. We remember, we gather at a table, we are all guests invited, we break bread, we pour out a cup, and we remember and proclaim that our God is risen, is living, is at work in the world, even in the church, even in our very lives here. So let us keep this feast. Amen. Please join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It's time now for the offering. And so I ask you now to look into your heart and see how you can give to the ministries of Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church. We are focused outward. We want to make the lives of people in our community better. See how you can be a part of that. There are several ways to give to Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church, and those ways are on your screen. Join me now in dedicating these gifts to God. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to take an inventory of what's in our hearts, for finding an abundance, any abundance there, of our time, of our talents and of our treasure. Use the gifts that we offer this morning to further your mission in this world and to help usher in your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, be opened. That's it. It's what Jesus says. It's what Jesus models for us. It's all that simple and it's all that hard. Be opened. Know that as we go out into the world with open hearts, open minds, open ears, open eyes, we're not going alone, but we're going as a community connected and surrounded by the love of God, attended by the peace of Christ, and kept by the companionship of the Holy Spirit, today and every day. Amen.